what manner of love hath the Father bestowed upon us that we could be called and become the sons of God. That God commended his love towards you and me. That while we were yet sinners, Jesus Christ, God's only begotten Son, died for you and me. I challenge you this holy week not to get so caught up with living that you don't stop and take time to realize the significance of Christ and what he did at Calvary and what he accomplished at the tomb. And then as you reflect on that in prayer, come into the service of Sunday with a desire to praise and celebrate Easter Sunday in victory to our Lord. We, uh, if anybody on earth has a right to celebrate in this life and in the life to come, it's the church and the Christian. A church alive is worth the drive, and it's becoming unique. In our day. Sad to say, but I say it truthfully, not critically, not with negativity, but just truthfully. Many and most churches are not alive today. And the reason that they're not alive is they have people who call themselves Christians attending there. And if they're not alive, neither will the church be. But we've been discussing on Wednesday nights the characteristics of a church that's alive. We need to know those so that we can be a part of a church that's alive or if it's dead, we can be instrumental in reviving it and if we can't accomplish that, we can get out of it and leave and find one that is. But the thing that I want to discuss tonight is something that I have witnessed in the 45 years that I have been in the pastorate. I've witnessed this particular characteristic in every church that is alive. Not almost in every church, but in every church. The characteristic that we're going to discuss for just a few moments will appear in every church that's alive. The great concern is that when it does surface, and it does appear, what will our response be? There's a right response, and there's a wrong one. 
if we choose to respond rightly, the church will grow. It will be strengthened. We will come to draw closer to God and one another. If we choose to respond in the wrong way, then a seed, a seed of, of bitterness or unforgiveness or malice will appear within the church and the life of the Christian and there will be an internal fighting among its midst. If you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Peter, the fourth chapter, verses 12 and 13. Let's look at the persecuted church and the persecuted Christian. 1 Peter, chapter 4. Verses 12 and 13. Now, many people have been taught wrong. And when you have been taught wrong, it is very difficult to unteach you of wrong or false doctrine. But many people have been taught that if you're a Christian, you're not going to have any problems. There will be no persecution. God's on your side, and everything will be just fantastic. The only problem with that is the Bible don't teach that. In fact, it teaches just the opposite. Now, I'm not going to ask you to stand tonight because I want you to leave the Bible on your lap or I want you to be able to look up here at the screen. But 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice in so much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. A teaching that Peter knew would become strange doctrine. And many people, because of persecution and trouble and tribulation as a Christian and as a church, would fall away. In the last days, there will be a great falling away. And the love of many will wax cold for the things coming to pass. Now I wonder tonight, how many have uh, been coming to this church for at least 20 years. Can I see your hand? All right. I challenge you that raised your hand to look around the congregation and see if the ones that you fellowshiped with 20 years ago are still here. Now, I'm not counting the ones that have died, 
and went to heaven. But the ones that started out, the ones that took office in the church, the ones that you see occasionally, well, where do we see them? Walmart, I guess. But where are they now? Persecutions and problems came into their life. And many because of struggling. Others because they became offended at something that was said or something that was done. Use that as an excuse to take it out on the Lord and the church. But here in these two verses, it's ironic that Peter writes and starts with our thinking. He said, I want to talk to you about your mind. I want to talk to you about your thought processes. The things that you think about. The things that you say to yourself. And is, that's a good place to start. And so as he starts there, he said, I don't want you to think it strange about the fiery trial which is going to test you and try you, don't wonder. Don't doubt. Don't ask God why this is happening unto you. Have you ever done that? Well, Lord, I don't understand it. I'm praying, I'm reading my Bible. Lord, I was in church Sunday. Sunday morning and Sunday night. Why is this happening to me? And many folks struggle and get out of church and out of the blessings of God because of the way they think. It's amazing to me how we can raise our young people in church. They can come up in our Sunday schools with some of the best Sunday school teachers that they could ever have. They could sit under some of the best preaching that they will ever hear. And yet when you talk to many of them, their thinking's on another planet. They're thinking about God and Christ and the church is foreign and strange. But Peter says, rejoice in so much that you're partakers of Christ's suffering. If you have trouble, you must be doing something right. If you're suffering as a Christian, so did Jesus. And we've not suffered unto blood yet. And he's writing here, Rejoice in so much as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. You see, we forget that this world 
it's not our final home. We can rejoice in the fact that one of these days, Jesus is coming again. We can rejoice in the fact that we're going to have a new body and experience eternal life. When the Lord's glory will finally be revealed, if we've been faithful in suffering and in persecution, we will be glad with exceeding joy. I want us to look at two more portions of Scripture found in 2 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, verses 22 through 28. The Apostle Paul is writing about his uh, personal spiritual experience. And he says in verse 22, Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant. In stripes above measure. In prisons more frequent. In deaths oft. Of the Jews five times Received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeyings often. In perils of waters. In perils of robbers. In perils by my own countrymen. In perils by the heathen in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in, the, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings oft, in cold and nakedness, beside those things that are without, that which cometh up on me daily, the care of all the churches. Who is weak, and I am not weak? Who is offended, and I burn not? If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern my infirmities. Isn't that something? That a man could praise God through all of the troubles, through all of the difficulties, by strangers, by friends, by kinfolk, in the city, in the country, hungry, without, and yet during those times, he said, I'm not weak. I'm not offended. In fact, I believe that our troubles bring us closer to God. If we had never had any problems, we'd never know that God could solve them. But through it all, we learn if we survive to trust in Jesus. Through it all, I've learned to trust in God. And Paul is writing here, explaining and telling us that through much trouble and through much tribulation, one day, someday, we're going to enter the kingdom of God. I've never seen a growing church that didn't have trouble in their families, 
in their marriages, the devil will do everything he can do to cause you to give in, to give up, to go back, to let down, to neglect, to backslide. Paul said, through much tribulation, one day, someday, we'll enter the kingdom of God. And that's why he told us, as he traveled to the churches, when he was at the church at Ephesus, he was talking about being strong in the Lord. And he said, in order to do that, in order to be strong in your faith, it is essential for you to put on the whole armor of God so that you might resist the devil because if you do, he will flee from you. Putting on the whole armor of God, the helmet of 